sing about chains falling. Come on, God. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Yeah. Love's made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Come on. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. I just encourage you today, this morning, to just lift your voices to Him. There is a promise that points beyond my failure. There is a still voice to silence all my fears even the worst of my mistakes are miracles in the making are miracles in the making by your stripes I am healed with one
touch, I am made whole. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. We sing this together, church. In the storm, you are peace, and your love won't let me go. You have spoken, and I know. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. Yes, God, we believe that you are the same, God, that you are faithful. God, that what you did then, you will do again. Come on, church, we sing this to you.
and Lord, we need you. God, and we just thank you so much that you draw close. God, that we can press in and there you are. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the breath in our lungs, God, that we can give it back to you. That we can exalt you and praise you. love you. We thank you. We give you glory. We give you all the honor and our worship. In Jesus' mighty name we say amen. Amen. Can we just give him a shout of praise in this moment for his worthiness and his faithfulness over everything? We're so glad you're here with us. Thank you for those joining us online. If you will, turn to the person next to you and tell them how great they look. And we'll be right back. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, welcome to Church of the King, all of you here. Uh, that, whether you're here, watching online, or whether I see you over there, guys, see y'all through there, all in our little our additional seating section. Uh, good to be with all of you. If it is your first time here, my name's Jason Robinson. I'm the pastor here at the church. Excited to have you with us. It's gonna, it's been an exciting, fun, fun morning. And uh, you're gonna learn a lot today. And so, hey, if it is your first time here, I wanna encourage you to do one thing. In the back of your seat, or for you guys that are out there uh, or online, you'll see a picture come on your screen. Uh, if it is your first time, if you take a moment, fill out the connection card, if it's your first time guest. Uh, let me tell you what'll happen if you do that. It'll come to our system. If you do it uh, physically, you can drop it off in that little black box. It's also where our tithes and offerings go as well on the way out, uh, if that's you. Uh, I'll tell you what'll happen. You'll just get a simple text message from me personally this week, just uh, thanking you for coming to church and seeing if there's anything we can do for you. Uh, Want to just be available to you if you need anything uh, whatsoever. So we'd love to love to love to have you. And so it's been a fun, fun day and uh, a lot of great things. In just a second, we're gonna look at our screen and we have an announcement video. And then after the announcement video, we'll have a little opener for our family university series that we have. And then Dr. James Emery White will be up here. I'll explain about him a little bit in just a second. So how many of y'all were here last week and enjoyed Do the Rossbergs, the, uh, the Rossbergs? Y'all enjoyed the Rossbergs? Man, there, 10 of you liked him. Okay, great, awesome, good to know. No, I'm just playing. So it was phenomenal, such a great, great time. Uh, let me tell you what we're learning about. We're learning about Gen Z today. All this came out of several months ago, just kind of had on my heart after Easter to have a, what we call a family university. I Man, just learn, learn about family, can learn how to communicate better, learn how to be a better husband, be a better parent, uh, and then learn about the generations to come. And so we honor, in this church, we honor all generations, but I, th I wanted to bring someone in that, that really had an expertise on Generation Z. And so that's really what we're zoning on. Uh, Dr. White has a book as well, Meet Generation uh, Z. Dr. White, you can look him up. He's accomplished in so many areas. Um, and so he, he theology, he had doctor's degrees in so many different areas and, and helped universities with, with culture and theology training and stuff. So we have the right person here, okay, uh, to help teach us. And let me tell you something. You about to go to school, all right? So uh, look the person right and left to you and say, let's go to class. Come on, just tell them, because you're about to go to class, all right? And so he's gonna tee the whole thing up, but we've been doing this just for this series. Come, uh, we'll have a, tonight at six o'clock, we'll have a workshop uh, with Dr. White as well, where he's gonna share, uh, he has a lot to share, but then we'll have some question and answers on how do we, how do we parent, how do we coach, how do we handle this next uh, generation. So also, I wanna uh, share this as well. I, I don't normally do this, but if you would, maybe even take out your phone and share the service. If you go to like our Facebook page or YouTube and just share this, say, hey, you need to know about Gen Z. If you don't know who that is, 25 and younger, basically. 25 and younger, why don't you guys check, check this out? We're learning a lot together and I think it's really gonna equip and, and help you. So, uh, so hey, do me a favor at Church of the King style after our video and Dr. White gets up here, let's go crazy and thank him because he took time away from his church in North Carolina to come here and equip us. So let's make sure we give honor where honor is due and give them a hand. Y'all help me with that? Awesome, all right, y'all look at the screen and, and uh, y'all get ready for a great time.
Hey church family, my name is Elijah Bowman and I'm currently a senior in our student ministry, The Movement. I want to take a few minutes to let you know about some of the events coming up for you and your family at COTK. On May 7th, we'll be having Baby Dedication Sunday. Baby Dedication is an event to symbolize your commitment to raise your child in a Christian home and church where they can come to know, love, and serve Jesus. To get your child signed up today, head over to cotk.org slash events. Students, summer camp is happening this summer, and I wanted to invite you to join us for a life-changing week. Junior high camp is from June 20th to the 23rd. High school camp is from the 26th to the 30th. You can register for camp today by going to cotk.org slash events. Thank you again for joining us for church today. Check out this video before we start week two of Family University. all downhill from here. <laughs> well, everyone, I want to thank Pastor Jason and Stephanie and the rest of the staff for inviting me to be a part of your church's multi-week focus on all things family, something I am heavily invested in personally. He alluded to the fact that I've got my feet in a couple of worlds. When I am a pastor of a church, that's almost entirely made up of people who are in their 30s and 20s. And so it's a very, very young church, been skewing younger every year for the last decade or so. And so we are neck deep in all things Gen Z and in raising and working with young families. I'm also a professor of theology and culture and uh, work greatly with the social sciences and studying those kinds of issues and have studied Gen Z extensively from that uh, standpoint. I also have a very personal interest. Uh, my wife Susan and I have been married for nearly 40 years and we have four children and 15 grandchildren. So uh, I feel like I populated Generation Z. <laughs> Speaking of kids, I know a lot of you have kids, but many of you don't. So let me just go ahead and clear out the very beginning how to know if you're ready to have kids. And I'm going to give you a few tests to see if you're ready. So first, let's see if you can stand the mess a kid makes. And here's how to find out. First, smear peanut butter on the sofa and jelly onto the curtains. Hide a piece of raw chicken behind the TV and leave it there all summer. <laughs> Stick your fingers in the flower bed and then rub them onto the walls. Spill milk on your pillows. Cover the stains with crayons. Take your favorite book and your favorite picture and your iPad and destroy them all. <laughs> now let's move on to your car to see if you're ready. There. Uh, first, obviously buy a minivan. No more fun cars. Then buy a chocolate ice cream cone and put it in the glove compartment. Get a dime, a quarter will work, but wedge it into the window, the DVD player, or the gear shaft. It doesn't matter as long as it wedges and you can't get it out. Take a family-sized package of chocolate cookies, mash them into the back seat, then sprinkle Cheerios all over the floor and smash them with your foot. And do this daily, or at least after every car wash. Finally, run a metal garden rake along both sides of your car. Just get it done. Now on to feeding. Now this is going to take some skill. Uh, hollow out some kind of melon like a cantaloupe and make a small hole in the side. And then suspend it from the ceiling and start it swinging from side to side. And then you get some yogurt and a spoon and you try to get the yogurt into the melon hole as it is swinging. But here's where it gets tricky. You have to do that while impersonating an airplane. Continue until half the yogurt is gone and pour the other half into your lap. Do that and you're ready for kids. Actually, there is one last thing to do to get ready. Find someone with kids and then find fault with their methods of discipline, their lack of patience, their appallingly low tolerance levels and how they allow their children to run wild. Then, third, suggest ways they can improve their child's breastfeeding and sleep habits and toilet training and table manners and overall behavior. 
And then, finally, go home and enjoy the feeling of superiority. <laughs> it's the last time you're going to have all the answers. What I have been asked to talk to you about today is not simply uh, about parenting, but about parenting a very specific group of people, the youngest generation, which is a generation different than any other that has come before. And it's easy to forget how different it is. You know, when you think about it this way, this fall, the college class of 2027 will begin their freshman year. That means they were born back in the year 2005. And let me tell you, when you think about it that way, that means that they've always known LeBron James as the most recognizable sports icon on the planet. Hillary Clinton has always had a more significant role in American politics than her husband, Bill. Facebook has been active their entire lives. They've never known a world without Twitter, without Google, YouTube, Android, Amazon, Kindle. They've never known a world without Netflix, which means they have no idea what a DVD player is for, much less what a DVD player even is. They've never known a world without the iPhone, which means they probably have never owned or operated a camera, unfolded a paper roadmap, or dialed anything. Barack Obama has been their first president that they can remember. Pope Francis has always been the Pope. Star Wars Episode Three: The Revenge of the Sith, the sixth in the franchise, came out the year they were born. They were just four years old when Steph Curry started playing in the NBA. They were five years old when the first iPad was released. When they were 10 years old, the 11th installment of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was released. They are the first generation since the Cold War to live with the real possibility of world war and global conflict. They're also the first generation in over 100 years that has had their lives upended by a global pandemic that took millions of lives. And they're known by a single letter. Unlike their predecessors, they're not boomers, they're not busters, they're not millennials. They're just simply known as Generation Z. They are officially the largest generation in modern history. So who falls in a Generation Z? I mean, besides the class of 2027. Essentially those born between around 1997 or so to around 2012. It's the generation that is now collectively under the age of 25. But who are they? Who are these people that we're trying to raise, we're trying to relate to, we're trying to engage? It is so important to know. You know, so many times when people talk about parenting, they do it without an awareness of the unique challenges that face us in terms of who it is we're trying to parent or who we're trying to coach or who we're trying to teach, who we're trying to engage. Which is why I've always wanted to say to people, look, if you're going to start talking about this, you've got to start almost culturally, the world in which these people live and the world which lives in them. I've long been intrigued as a result by uh, really an almost obscure passage in the Old Testament scriptures. It's almost a throwaway comment about a group of people uh, within the people of Israel. They were known as the men of Issachar. Now, we don't know a whole lot about them, but Issachar himself was the fifth son of Jacob and Leah, the ninth son overall of the patriarch. He himself had four sons and went with his father into Egypt where he died and was buried. Afterward, his descendants formed one of the tribes of Israel. And by the end of the wanderings of Israel through the Sinai desert, they had numbered around 60,000 fighting men. When the promised land was apportioned, the men of Issachar received 16 cities as well as their adjoining villages. Moses looked at them, and here was his description of the men of Issachar. You're a strong ass, he said, in a beautiful land. And he meant it as a compliment. So what is most evident is that by the time of David, they were numbering around 90,000 people, and they were known supremely for their wisdom. It was even noted in the Talmud that the wisest members of the Sanhedrin came from the men of Issachar. But here's what intrigues me. It was the nature of their wisdom. And it's they had laid out specifically for us. What was it about their wisdom that was so significant? In the first book of Chronicles, this is what it said. From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. That is intriguing to me. 
They knew the signs of the times and how best to live in light of those signs. You know, to know the signs of the times is more than knowing headlines and tweets. It's knowing what's significant among the happenings of the world. Events and movements and trends and ideologies and currents and worldviews. It's knowing what is shaping us and forming us and molding us. But that's not all. The men of Issachar didn't simply know those signs, but they knew how to live in light of them. And that includes how to parent. So let me tell you what I want to do this morning. I want to give you some signs of the times. And they're not going to be fun. (laughs) I'm, I'm going to purposefully depress you for a little while and give you a real clear state of things. And then when we come back together tonight... We're going to roll up our sleeves. We're going to get heavily on the solution side of things. But I want to start off this particular way. I feel very strongly about going with the signs of the times first. And then we'll talk how Israel should respond. But that's going to take a little bit longer. And we're going to do that tonight where I unpack that and also just have some Q&A to undo it. But what I want to do is just give you five defining characteristics that are critical to understand about Generation Z. So let's jump in. The first one is, they are crisis marked. The earliest memory of those born in 1997 was probably the smoke rising from the twin towers of 9-11. That was followed by the Great Recession. Beginning in 2007, this economic era is widely considered the worst global downturn since World War II. While millennials were raised during the boom times and relative peace of the 90s, only to see their picture-perfect world dashed by 9-11 and the two economic crashes in 2000 and 2008, Generation Z has never known anything else. They've had their eyes open to the harsh realities of the modern world from day one. They've never known anything other than the era of the war on terror and the Great Recession. And now throw in global pandemics. And the pandemic took a unique toll on them, particularly the younger edge of Gen Z. It was at least for many of them around the world a year of education, largely lost. There was an article in the New York Times that noted that they have experienced a childhood without children, meaning a year or more of their life without birthday parties, without play dates, without daycare. For the little older students, there were no graduations or proms or sports. Which begins to explain the television and movie series that they've made popular. This is an interesting way to study this generation. What is it that they have made so popular in media? And what kind of media are they attracted to? Well, think about it. Generation Z has lived in a world marked by chaos, uncertainty, volatility. So it shouldn't surprise us that they've made blockbusters out of The Hunger Games, Handmaid's Tale, The Divergent series, Walking Dead, And more recently, HBO's Last of Us, which began first as a game and then was made into a series. All of these, if you study them, it's interesting. They're all depictions of people, usually teenagers, left alone to face a dystopian future. So when news breaks of the latest terrorist attack or school shooting, they can still be shocked by it, but they're not surprised by it. Because life for them has always been like that. This has led to a very strong sense of an independent spirit and an entrepreneurial spirit. But their goal is not simply economic security. They're marked by a very strong sense of wanting to make a difference and thinking that they can. They want to be social entrepreneurs. This may explain why when MTV conducted this massive nationwide survey of teens that were born after the year 2000, they wanted to see how they would self-identify. Essentially, they said, okay, everybody's calling you Generation Z, but let's clear that away. How would you describe yourself? If there was a name for your generation, what would you want it to be? You know what the number one choice was? They wanted to be called the founders, as in needing to found a new world, rescuing it from the sins of its past. Well, here's a second mark of Gen Z. This generation is Wi-Fi enabled. You know, many refer to millennials as being digital natives due to their comfort and innate abilities with digital technology. They don't have anything on Gen Z. Gen Z is the first internet in its pocket generation. The speed by which this technological revolution has taken place is just stunning. And it really does make it difficult for older generations to realize how radically different the world is that Generation Z has been born into. 
See, while baby boomers can't remember a world without TV, and millennials can't remember a world without computers, Gen Z can't remember a world without constant, immediate, convenient access to the internet. You know, when Steve Jobs, um, and I don't know if you ever watched the original debut of the iPhone, when he announced the iPhone at this huge Apple corporate gathering, and it went viral on YouTube, where he said, look, we're going to bring three projects together. An iPod, remember those? <laughs> a phone, and internet connectivity. And he says, I think it's going to be revolutionary. He had no idea how revolutionary it would be. Even he didn't know it had been unleashed. And make no mistake, the iPhone changed the world. In one of his books on American culture, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Tom Friedman had an entire chapter that was called, What the Heck Happened in 2007? Only he didn't say heck. Uh, he makes a case it was one of the most pivotal years in all of human history. And not just because that was the year the iPhone was released, and it was. The iPhone was released in 2007. But because of all that was set in motion and all that came into play in a simultaneous way. Because here, make this little grocery list. Beyond the iPhone in 2007, Facebook left the campus and entered the wider world. Twitter was spun off. Google bought YouTube, and it launched Android. Amazon released a Kindle. Netflix started streaming, uh, streaming videos. And the internet crossed one billion users worldwide, the tipping point to it becoming the fabric of our world. All of that happened in 2007, when the first members of Generation Z were 10 years old. Which means they're the first and only generation that is native to all of this. The only one that hasn't had to adapt so what does this mean for Generation Z? Well, for one thing, it means that they're able to be the most independent generation in all of history. They're the first generation to have the ability to find whatever they want without the help of intermediaries, such as libraries, shops, teachers, parents. They just need Google. That's all they need. This has made them more self-directed than any other generation before them. But it also makes them the most vulnerable Never before has there been such a wide chasm between almost unlimited access to information and almost no access to wisdom. Well, then there's the world of social media, which is not merely second nature to them. That is their primary nature. And I know some of you think, oh, okay, finally something I know. Social media, yeah, Facebook, I know that. Okay, you may know Facebook. Generation Z does not know Facebook. They're a lot more private about things than their millennial elders they gravitate less toward Facebook and more toward anonymous social media platforms like Snapchat and Secret and TikTok and Whisper. In fact, there was a, a Mashable article um, by, written by a 13-year-old, and the title of it was, I'm 13, and none of my friends use Facebook. See, Facebook is for old people. <laughs> Here's the ultimate insult. A kid will say, Facebook? Oh, that's so my parents. <laughs> But regardless of the type, because social media is their nature, that's where they're going to be connected with. That's where they're going to get and share information. And because of the nature of social media, this means that no other generation is more shaped by other people's opinions and word of mouth. Or, as you'll often hear them say, they're going to do their own research. You know, they'll, they'll have to say, well, let me, I'll need to research that, or I'll, let me give, do some research on that. Now, you know what that's code for? That's code for, I'm going to sift through vast amounts of online information and misinformation, but I'm, not, but I'm going to be doing that without any real sense of right and wrong, good or bad, true or false. I don't have a sense of true north guiding me through that, so I'm going to be moved by what is most persuasive and seems most convincing, which is terrifying to think about. And ironically, here's another thing about social media in this generation. Studies have proven that this generation, no generation is more lonely. No generation is more lonely. There was a massive uh, study by Cigna, uh, the global insurer, and they pulled 20,000 Americans aged 18 and older, and they were using the famous UCLA loneliness scale to do it. And the survey asked them whether they would agree with certain things. Things like, there is no one I can turn to. Agree or disagree? Uh, I feel part of a group of friends. Agree or disagree, and on a scale. Generation Z, 
or at least a segment between the ages of 18 and 22, polled the loneliest of all. Not even the oldest of the old were as lonely as the youngest of the young. The most lonely generation on this planet. So the first generation raised in the context of social media is not being served socially at all. Now, it's not that social media is isolating them further. That would be a caricature. It's just not helping them to avoid loneliness. In fact, it gives this illusion of community. See, here's what's happening. Social media is providing this false sense of relief. They they attempt socialization on their phones at home, leading them away from face-to-face interaction. Or as one Ball State professor put it, I have students who tell me they've got 500 friends on this platform, but there is no one that comes to them at point of need. They don't really have friends. Well, let me give you a third mark of Generation Z is that they're naturally diverse. For example, being multiracial is just considered normal. Uh, Let me kind of give you a snapshot on this. Right now, there's been, just over the last three decades, a 400% increase in black, white, multiracial marriages. There's been a 1,000% increase in Asian, white marriages. Overall, multiracial children are the fastest growing youth group in the United States. Multiracial kids, fastest growing youth group in the United States, which makes Generation Z the most racially diverse of any generation to date. And that diversity spills out. Remember, they're connected, which means that their social circles are not limited to geography. They're often global in nature. One researcher uh, found that 26% of Gen Z would need to fly to get on an airplane to visit most of their social network friends. So if you think acceptance and tolerance is a key virtue in our world today, Generation Z holds it to be their most cardinal virtue. Being inclusive is everything to them. Some have described this as the kumbaya dynamic. In other words, Generation Z standing around in a circle holding hands because the rest of the world is too busy throwing knives and firing bullets. So are you with me so far? When it comes to Generation Z, there are five primary characteristics. We've just looked at three of them. They're crisis marked. They're Wi-Fi enabled. They are naturally diverse. This next one, I'm glad you're sitting. (laughs) Because it may be even a phrase you've never heard before. The fourth mark is that they're sexually fluid. Now again, let me unpack that because that may be a new term. There was a recent Gallup poll that found that 5.6% of all U.S. adults would identify as being part of the LGBTQ community. They would self-identify. And the vast majority of them would say they're bisexual. Um, When you take, Gallup then surveyed Gen Z to see if they mirrored the 5.6% of the national population. And they found out that they did not. It wasn't 5.6%. It was 15.9%. This massive increase. One in six adults in Gen Z consider themselves LGBTQ. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's stunning. So Gallup started to figure out what's going on here. Why has this number of about 5%, which has been constant really since we've been charting it, suddenly when we get to Gen Z, it like more, almost quadruples. And they found out that it's not a true shift in sexual orientation. It's just simply a new openness to all things sexual. And a sense that they should be open to all things sexual. That somehow they're not being true to themselves or true to finding out who they are unless they are open to all things sexual. See, this is the generation that has come of age in the era that put all of this in the mainstream. You just take one year, the year 2015, which was in the heart of a lot of Gen Z development. In that one year, you had the Supreme Court legalize gay marriage. In that one year, you had former Olympian-turned-reality TV star Bruce Jenner very publicly become Caitlyn Jenner, even landing on the cover of Vanity Fair. And it's from this kind of context that Gen Z has become sexually and relationally amorphous. Just consider the influential statements by outspoken young celebrities like Kristen Stewart, Miley Cyrus, or Cara Delevingne. Stewart first who came onto fame with the Twilight series, said this about her own sexuality. She said, I think that in three or four years, there's going to be just a whole lot more people who don't think it's necessary to figure out if you're gay or straight. 
You just do your own thing when you want with who you're with. Miley Cyrus, I don't relate to being boy or girl, and I don't have to have my partner relate to boy or girl. See, that's what I mean by sexually fluid. It's refusing either the homosexual or the heterosexual label. It's refusing the male or the female label. The idea is that all labels are repressive. Sexuality should be set free by any and all restrictions and allowed to follow its desire moment by moment, person by person, experience by experience. Which is why many high schoolers will say that they feel like they need to have at least one bisexual experience just to be true to themselves, to see if they are LGBTQ, even if they have absolutely no orientation toward that whatsoever. They just feel it's an expectation. I need to do that for myself. Well, that brings us to a fifth and final characteristic. They are post-Christian, which shouldn't surprise us because we live in a post-Christian world. There have only been three eras in relation to the Christian faith, pre-Christian, Christian, and post-Christian. I think most of us have heard about the rise of the nuns. The nuns are the religiously unaffiliated. When asked about their religion or their faith affiliation on various surveys and public polls, they don't answer Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian or anything else. They, they simply check the box that says nothing, or the box that says none, or none of the above. When I first began researching and writing about the nuns, they made up one out of every five Americans, which made them the second largest religious group in the United States, second only to Catholics. And not only that, they were by far the fastest growing religious group in the nation. That's when I first started studying them. By 2021, the percentage of Americans who self-designated as atheist, agnostic, or of no particular faith rose to 29% of all U.S. adults. That's nearly one out of every three adults, up a whopping 10 percentage point in a handful of years. Absolutely unheard of in the social sciences. And the first generation to be marked by that new cultural context is Generation Z. They were the first generation that has been raised in a post-Christian context. And as a result, they are the first truly post-Christian generation. And the, the impact on that is not hard to see. When you start doing spiritual surveys and religious surveys of Gen Z, here's what you find, that they're largely unchurched. The percentage of them being nuns goes way up. Them being atheists is triple the normal population. They have few of any religious leaders or role models. They are spiritually illiterate. They are biblically illiterate. Let me put it as bluntly as I know how. This is a lost generation. They are not simply living in and being shaped by a post-Christian cultural context. They don't even have the memory of the gospel. And in our time together later today, if you choose to join us, and I hope you will, I'll be, I'll be digging into what can be done to reach this generation spiritually. Specifically, how, how can you begin to stem the tide of even what's happening within Christian circles, which is this rise of deconstruction sweeping over this generation, where people who were once Christian are now deconstructing and moving away from the Christian faith. And, and what is up with that? And how can we begin to address this? We'll be talking about later on, like what are the three, two or three major topics, questions that are being asked by Gen Z that the Christian church isn't even answering? In fact, I would warrant that the typical church in America has never had a single message series on any of the top questions Gen Z has. And I'll tell you exactly what those are later today. So we're going to get into it and what a parent can do, what a grandparent can do. There's so much that we're going to be unpacking. But like I said, um, depression first, solution later. <laughs> but make no mistake, they're marked by a profound spiritual emptiness. They have never encountered God or experienced God, at least by name. There is a spiritual vacuum. There's a spiritual hole. They're, they're really left to feel the sickness of the world's disease without a narrative, without a story, without a transcendent meaning or purpose. They have a, they have a crisis in values. They find themselves needing them but not having them and divorce from any means of finding them. There's a lack of vision. There is nothing calling them upward to be more than they are beyond themselves. They have incredibly empty souls. You know, they're not plagued by the first part of Frederick Nietzsche's famous claim that God is dead. You may have, you may have had to read Nietzsche. 
or an anthology that had selections of him when you were in high school or college. But really, when you, Nietzsche is an interesting person. You keep reading him on that essay. That's where it gets interesting. But go back and reread it. After he said, God is dead, he went on to say, and it's we who have killed him. And then he says, how shall we, the murderer of all murderers, ever comfort ourselves? One of the things I've always felt I can compliment Nietzsche about is that he lived with the reality and the conclusions of his own worldview and philosophy, which was complete despair. That's the world in which they were born. And that's the world that was born in them. And they're feeling it, that hunger. And they hunger and they thirst for the spiritual. Reminds me of a story Frederick Buechner once told of a boy, 12, 13 years of age, who in a fit of crazy anger and depression got hold of a gun and shot and killed his father. When the authorities asked the boy why he had done it, he said he he couldn't stand his father. He said his father demanded too much of him. He was always after him because he hated his father. Later, after he'd been placed in a house of detention, a guard was walking down the corridor late one night when he heard sounds coming from the boy's room. And he stopped to listen. And the words that he heard, the boy sobbing out into the dark over and over were, I want my father. I want my father. And Beekner observes that the story of the boy is a kind of parable for our lives. We've killed off our father, and now we feel the emptiness that it brings. Imagine how Generation Z must feel growing up in that fatherless world. But they don't have to be orphans. Let me read you some of the most important parenting advice that has ever been given from the Bible comes from Moses, one of the most famous personalities in all of biblical history. And the passage I'm going to read to you may be familiar to some of you, but what I want you to hear afresh is the context. Because that's what stands out to me about this passage. Not just what it says, but the context of it. Because see, it, it came to work right at the end of his life. And uh, as the people of Israel were getting ready to enter the famous promised land, he knew he would not be taking them in. God had already told him that his run was over. His leadership run had ended. And so he gathered them all together to give him his final words, the culmination of his wisdom, one last life lesson, what God had most impressed on his spirit as they would go forward in history without him. It was all about parenting. It was all about making sure that they passed this faith baton on to the next generation. And here are his words. And just, yes, you know, just imagine the passion. Because he's, he's repeating himself in the way he's doing it. I mean, he was on a riff. He said, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. And here's where he goes off. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I mean, it's like, is my point made? Moses lays out one of the most important parenting principles that there is. When it comes to parenting, you've got to be intentional. To use Moses' words, you have to impress things on your children. You know, the word impress is interesting. It's from a Hebrew word that meant sharp. The idea is that when it comes to parenting our children spiritually, we're to be doing it in a way that drives it down deep into their soul, sharp like a knife, penetrating, going deep. Imagine like a surgeon's scalpel. So you as a parent not only have to be the one taking responsibility for your child's spiritual formation, but you're to be doing it in the most permeating, penetrating way you can imagine. Knife-like. And you can do that. You can do that. And that's what we're going to talk about later today in tonight's session, how to do that. But for now, understand the unique challenges of parenting today in light of the unique challenges of who it is we are parenting. They are crisis-centered. They are Wi-Fi-enabled. They are naturally diverse. They are sexually fluid. And they are thoroughly post-Christian. Those are the signs of the times. Next, we'll turn to what Israel should do. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this time together. And I do pray that it has been eye-opening and challenging. I do. I hope it has been uncomfortable. It should be. We, as parents, need to be motivated. 
And so here I just simply pray that what was of you will remain in our hearts and minds and what is not will quickly fade away, but that it will be the power and work of the Holy Spirit in us that makes that decision for us. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. White. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. White said, I'm, I'm going to try to depress you at first. Did he depress anybody? Or you did, did good. All right. But sometimes you need to know how bad the problem is so you're so committed to figuring out the answer. That is a thing, by the way. Do you know a lot of people don't even realize there's a problem until somebody shows there's a problem. But then ultimately you bring the answer in after that. And uh, so many f conversations I've had in between Dr. White. Uh, the first one was when Dr. White said 2007 was the year that changed the world. My youngest texted me, said, uh-huh, that was the year I was born. Uh, so if y'all were wondering why, Elise changed the course of history. All right, because she was born that time. But no, I've heard so many different conversations from, I had a, a coach that I was talking to uh, in between service and they said they remember their daughter was four years old and, her, and they remember her saying, do we have to keep watching stuff with buildings falling? That was like at four years old because, because of that. that they, that's the climate that they grew up in. And so, uh, so we're really gonna learn. So if you can come, we, we will live stream it tonight. So if you got something going on, you can watch it. We'll leave it. It's gonna stay up there on Facebook or YouTube. So if you need to watch it later, you can watch what it's about. But I will say this. I do wanna encourage you with this is, uh, man, I didn't tell you this either, doctor. I, I didn't, uh, I've often thought, never did end up doing this, but that scripture, I wanted to put on a plaque and put it over all my kids' doors. That was that, was, that was that scripture, wherever you go. And I'll just tell you this, parents, this is what I'll say. One of the greatest ways we can help disciple this, just be engaged in their life. Do not bow out. Do not just expect other things to take care of it. Be engaged. You might be shocked at all the conversations that have happened in the Robinsons household. There's not been nothing off limits in the Robinson household. And there's been challenging things they've thrown at us. And I said, okay, let's talk about that. And this is what I always say, bring them back to the Bible. Because every generation thinks they're the smartest and they're gonna fix all the other stuff that came ahead. Let's bring them back to what the word of God says. And so, man, I'm so proud of you. I wanna thank you guys as well. You, for many of you, you've loved either your parent here and you're thinking about your kids. Some of you, your kids are grown or maybe you don't have kids. And so many uh, even parents that just love this generation. We have so many who volunteer. Uh, they, they serve on the dream team with our kids or even in youth on, on Wednesdays. Thank you for serving and loving them and education, whatever the things that you do. Uh, that we can be there. And I'll tell you this, we are going after this generation because this is what we see all throughout scripture. Whenever there's a time where it seems dire, God preserves a remnant and he raises up leaders in the midst of that to be a voice for their generation. And that's what we're believing God's gonna do with our kids. And that's what we're after. Hey, by the way, Wednesday nights, they're a blast, but I'm here. We're giving them the word of God. We're showing them what the word of God says about it. How do you handle what God says and you reject the things? Mia was sharing a message they did the other day where they had a truth chair and a feeling chair. And he said, okay, you feel this, but this is the truth. And the truth has to be connected to a scripture. That's what your kids are learning. And so, man, come back tonight, man. We're gonna learn so many good things. I am excited. I cannot wait. And uh, can y'all give it up for Dr. White one more time? Just thank, thank me. So why don't you stand up? I'll pray for you, let you go. If you're a part of the prayer team, you can come down to the front. We will be here to pray for you, anything you may need. Father, I thank you for your people today. God, man, wow, what a sobering message, but what a critical message. Lord God, even some of the things that were said, it was like, wow, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I have four kids that are Gen Z, all of them, raising them, and so Father, I just, uh, I pray, Lord God, that, that you would raise hope in this room, Lord Jesus, that Father, that in all your wisdom, in all the years we could be born, you put us at such a time as this. So that means you have given us the equipment, the anointing and the power that we need to raise this generation. And what so many are gonna consider lost, Father, I'm just believing for a sweeping awakening and revival amongst our students. We're already seeing bits and pieces of it because they're done with the fake, they're done with the stuff, and they want something real. And God, there's nothing more real than you. God, I pray in scripture where it says 
that your eyes look to and fro to see who you might display your power through, that your eyes would be able to stop right here. And you could say, I can give all the generations to this church and this community because they're gonna disciple them and they're gonna change the world. So Father, I bless your people as they go. Let your favor surround them like a shield and help us to extend your kingdom in all we do in Jesus' name. And everybody said loud and strong, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. We love you guys. Hey, hope to see you tonight at six. If not, we'll see you online. God bless you. You have a great week.